Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is Li Mingjiao. I'm head of Asia for GWAC. I've been working with GWAC and with the wind, wind energy industry for the past 15 years. And the past four years, I've been leading GWAC's work in Asia with a focus of Southeast Asia and East Asia markets. In Asia Pacific, in the past two years, we have seen, we have seen fundamental changes on the energy policy landscape in that the net zero concept is no longer foreign, but has been, has been embraced by most of the major economy in the region. And that means by middle of this century, we need to see fundamental changes on the energy policy. And that changes need to start from today. And that also means energy transition need to become a reality, which is basically driven by high share of renewable energy. And that need, to, that need to start from today. And right at this moment, we came across the maturity of the offshore wind technology, which proved to be both techni technically and economically viable to power this energy transition, which is very much needed as of today in both APEC and in the world. And that's why we're seeing in the past two years, all the major Asia markets are starting to introduce very ambitious offshore wind targets by 2030, 2040, and 2050. Yet the challenge still remains, and the main challenges lies in the following three aspects. First and foremost, there is a lack of route to market, which is a holistic framework for policy that including the leasing, permitting, and off-taker mechanism. Most of the Asia-Pacific countries are still in the middle of figuring it out. Second, this whole race of clean energy is happening globally. It's not just in Asia Pacific. It's being accelerated in Europe and also in the US. What does that mean? That means this whole, um, that means that we are facing a global supply chain crunch, which is happening right now. And that also requires us to basically ramp up our manufacturing capacity for both turbine and the key components from today. And these whole challenges will be further exacerbated in the second half of this decade. And as of today, we see major, major challenges at all the key stage on the construction of the offshore wind um, processes, which is being interrupted by the lack of vessels, lack of skilled workers, and lack of adequate um, infrastructures, both being the ports and the grids. Last but not least, our sector is also being impacted by the whole global economy. That being the inflation happening around the world, the, raw, the soaring of the material prices for all the raw materials. And with all this being present as the daily challenges, despite that whole glorious future in the fu uh, in, by the middle of this decade that our industry need to conquer it all, how do we solve it? How do we survive between now and then? And can we really navigate all these supply chain crunches that we're facing nowadays? Can we really navigate our way through the permitting and the whole route to market challenges? And can we really ramp up our manufacturing capacity fast enough to meet all the needs, all, the, all this energy transition needs that we need to see as of today? Those are the questions that we hope in the next hour we can, all these speakers on the stage will provide you some, some great answers. And we're also truly privileged and truly happy to have invited five of the top industry leaders from the five of the top Asia Pacific developers. And they will share with us not only on these challenges, but also on how our industry will navigate through all these challenges and grow out of it with more power and more strength. Without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Jonathan Cole, CEO of the Corio Generation. Jonathan will share with us the three key enablers for the offshore market, that being route to market, permitting, and the grid. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's very nice to be here all the way in Melbourne. It's nice to see so many people have made the trip. 
So I'm going to talk about the big enablers uh, for offshore wind. I'm actually going to talk about four enablers, not three, but that's OK. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to talk a bit about where we are as an industry. Now, there's a, an expression used in, in English, which is somehow said to originate in, in China because it's known as the Chinese curse. I don't know if it actually does come from China. But the expression goes, may you live in interesting times. Uh, and of course, that sounds very nice because we all want to live in interesting times. But really, what it means is, may you live in times of terrible chaos and uncertainty. And for the people who have been working in the offshore wind industry for the past 10 or more years, I think we can resonate very well with that expression because we seem to have lived through nothing but times of great chaos and uncertainty. And, and every year, it seems, in this industry, we say to ourselves, this is the hardest year we've ever had in offshore wind. But if we just get through these next few hurdles, next year will be much easier. And then we get to the next year and we say, this is the hardest year we've ever had in offshore wind. And it never seems to get any easier. And if we think back of the journey we've been on, proving that the technology worked in the first place, proving we could deploy the technology at scale, um, proving we could integrate into the grid, proving we could reduce the cost to be competitive with other technologies. All of these were existential hurdles that we overcame. Um, and all of those, you know, we, we met those challenges um, uh, you know, and, and beat them out of the park. But yet here we are today, probably in the most challenging circumstances of all. Now, one thing we have achieved as offshore wind is I think it's now received wisdom that offshore wind has to be part of the energy mix. In a decarbonised world, offshore wind is an essential part of that mix. And practically every country now with a coastline is looking at a way of bringing offshore wind energy into the system. But here we are today uh, in a scenario where I think it's fair to say it has never been any more challenging because we've got this conspiracy of factors going against us. We have cost of capital going up uh, at a rate faster than we've seen in the past 40 years. And that's really significant for our sector because cost of capital is one of the biggest input costs to producing electricity from offshore wind. And also it drives up the return requirements for investors. We've got an inflationary environment, again, that we haven't seen for a long time, which is putting further pressure on the economic models for offshore wind. And we're also faced with a, a situation where the supply chain has never been more fragile at a point in time when we really need the supply chain to be ramping up. So offshore wind is an essential part of a decarbonised future, but it's facing some pretty big challenges just now. Now, Winston Churchill once said, success is never final, failure is never fatal, it's having the courage to continue that counts. And I think that's the way we need to look at the situation we're in. The successes we've had haven't solved all of our problems. We always have new problems to face. When you're doing something as important as we're doing, there's always going to be big challenges. But equally, the challenges we're facing just now are not fatal challenges. We will get through them. And what really matters is having the courage to keep going. And what that means is focusing on these big enabling uh, items that we have to stay focused on. Because offshore wind is a long cycle game. If the decisions we make today, originating projects, will create projects 10 years from now. So if we slow down now because of the sentiment right now, we're really going to feel the effect of that at the end of this decade and into the next decade when we really need that power the most. So what are those big enablers? Well, the first thing that we need to be thinking about is how we allocate seabed. Now, um, I think there's many different models to follow. Um, and there's probably many different opinions about what model works best. But the way I would look at it is this. If offshore wind is a strategic play where you're looking at more than just producing power, what you're trying to do is create decarbonisation, energy security, energy independence, investment in infrastructure, investment in jobs, affordable energy, then you have to treat it like a strategic play and you have to choose the, the, the developers to develop your seabed that are going to meet your strategic aims. So processes which are designed to just see who's willing to pay the highest cost to get the seabed are probably aiming in the wrong direction because they're just aiming to put cost into the system. What you really want is processes that are designed to select 
the developers who are best able to meet your needs. So I think my suggestions on, on seabed allocation would be that firstly, you need qualitative processes designed to find the developers who will meet your strategic needs. All the better if you can marry international developers with experience with local developers that really know the local requirements. And you need to run those processes very regularly and put enough volumes in the system to make a market, not just one or two projects. The second thing is permitting. Now, uh, permitting is one of the biggest bottlenecks in our industry because it's taking somewhere between eight and 10 years on average for a project to get from inception to producing power. And a lot of that is down to permitting delays. Now, that's not to say that we should just think about fast-tracking permitting and cutting corners because social license and environmental sustainability is a really important part of what we do. So we have to find the right balance between making communities feel like they're involved in the process, but also driving for the strategic outcome that countries need. And again, I would say if there's a few suggestions to make, one would be to have very clear national priorities, a very clear strategic framework that makes it clear that offshore wind is a priority, which means that solutions have to be found to things like shipping and fishing and radar and all of these other issues instead of leaving it to developers to solve on their own. Where you have multi-layered processes with national and state and local um, approval processes, try to streamline and consolidate those as best you can, because those inconsistent processes and multi-layers cause delay and confusion. And, and number three would be try to combat disinformation. At, at the very top level of, of politics and government, we should be doing more to fight against this false narrative that renewables doesn't work or renewables is unnecessary or climate change is a hoax. So we need that kind of leadership to really make permitting fit for purpose. The third thing is on grid. Now, in every single country, grid eventually becomes the factor that slows us down. And really, the reason for that is because there is a lack of strategic planning in the way we set out our grid transmission system. And uh, there is a real nervousness about making anticipatory investments, an obsession almost about not leaving stranded assets. And what that means is we always invest too late in the grid because grid isn't just about regulatory policy and planning. It's then about engineering and procuring and actually building the grid. And that takes a decade. So what we really need is anticipatory investment, strategic plans to build the grid system. Now, again, if I was making suggestions, I'd say, firstly, go early with your onshore reinforcement. In every country, the onshore grid system is usually the thing that slows it down. So go early. And here in Victoria, actually, they're, I think, you know, doing a very smart thing by going early and looking at how to put the, the onshore grid in place uh, before the projects are even known. Second thing is try to create an offshore network of projects. The more these projects are in interconnected, the more resilient they are, the more redundancy there is, the less infrastructure you need offshore, the more cost effective it is, and also the less landfall points you have and therefore the more environmentally acceptable it is. And the third thing is, treat grid like enabling infrastructure and remunerate it as such. It doesn't make sense to force transmission systems to be built by developers and then somehow remunerated along with wind farms, taking volume risk and you know, turbine performance risk and all the rest of it on that type of infrastructure. So remunerate it in the right way. Those, those would be the suggestions on grid. And the final thing is route to market. Now, I've been involved in this industry for a long time. I was part of many processes to help reduce the cost of offshore wind. And I remember celebrating as we brought the cost of offshore wind below the cost of nuclear, and then we brought the cost of offshore wind below the cost of gas, and then somehow we just kept bringing the cost down and bringing the cost down, and we never stopped uh, until we're in the situation we're in just now, where probably, in many markets, the price that's being set for offshore wind isn't a price that creates a sustainable market. So what we really need is a process that sets the price for offshore wind in a fair way that is cost reflective. There's no reason why renewable energy should be the only part of society that doesn't get to uh, adjust its costs in the face of all these inflationary pressures. And also there's value reflective, because what we're doing here is not just producing cheap power, we're producing decarbonization and energy security and energy independence and job creation. And the other thing is set the price at an appropriate point in the process. 
There are many examples from the past where the price has been set too early, and either developers have earned too much money, or without, as we've seen in, in, in some markets right now, the, the project becomes unsustainable because the market has turned in a way that th those prices don't work. So, finding a price discovery process that sets a fair price at the right time is important, and going long on contracts, creating stable long-term prices has a real value to society. In Europe, we see right now the value of stability when we've been suffering the cost of instability over the past year or so. So, if we do all of that, there's no reason why we can't keep this offshore wind program on track. Um, I think that it's easy sometimes in this industry to think the challenges are just too great or we're too late getting on with it, but that's not true. The, the, you know, this is the moment we need to act. This is the moment we need to have the courage to continue. So, with that, what I would say is at Corio Generation, we are here in the APAC region to work with everyone in this room to try and drive the offshore wind sector forward across the APAC region and really make this happen. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan, for this. Some very strong key messages coming from, from, the, the, prison, uh, from the speech just now. A very clean and clear visibility of the target in the future of the volume. Second, a robust permitting system that doesn't compromise all different stakeholders. Third, a holistic planning for the grid and for the infrastructures. All this will help us build a very robust Asia-Pacific offshore wind industry that will replicate the whole cost reduction kind of successful stories in the Europe. With that, I'll introduce our second speaker, uh, Michael Hannibal, who is the partner of Copenhagen, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, and he will talk to us about early market entrance opportunities and managing risk, lessons learned from the global experience. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will start saying, luckily, the enablers Jonathan rightfully told about is actually fitting the le lessons learned. So, so that's kind of good, because if there was a mismatch between the lessons learned and the enablers, the explains I would be a little bit nervous. You know, this title, uh, Early Market Entry in Offshore Wind Lessons Learned, uh, that's, that's a little bit telling about my life. Uh, I have lived a longer life in offshore wind than what the turbines was designed for, uh, so more than 20 years. Lifetime of turbines have now grown, so uh, I intend to stay until uh, I can match the, the released uh, lifetime of, of uh, up to 30 years now, uh, hopefully. So a lot of experience and a lot of things seen uh, over the time. I started in the early days in ABB, providing components, medium voltage, high voltage solutions into it. Moved uh, to bonus energy, uh, which became Siemens wind power, 14 years there. Uh, the last half of them as uh, global CEO for the offshore wind. And then moved rightfully as a partner in CIP. Part of moving was somehow it must be smarter uh, working with projects from the developer side, at least then you can try to be more predictable towards your suppliers. I'm still struggling with that, and I moved in 2017. Uh, some of the enablers uh, for being more predictable is rightfully from, from, said from, from Jonathan. Um, I think a lot of countries should actually uh, have a good applause uh, so, and, and a high recognition for what they have done um, for, for actually trying to bring offshore wind into the energy mix. And of course, as the industry have not slept on it, a lot of countries, um, the government, uh, the kind of bureaucrats should not sleep on it. It's, it's busy times if we are to achieve what we basically should achieve. Uh, so I think uh, some of the, uh, you can say, general lessons learned is it has been difficult to keep speed in processes. And Jonathan explained well uh, the, the average time for permit and consenting. But I think uh, from, from that side, it's, it's also um, 
certification. It's also, uh, Jonathan mentioned also the, the offtake situation, what is needed, um, and, and local contents, uh, and, and auction systems. Um, all these elements play into it. Um, and if we then look back in time and say, what, what have actually, what have kind of been characteristic? Uh, if I look back at US, traveling in US from, from the early uh, 2000s, um, being part of developing the first offshore wind uh, project, Cape Wind, which had basically uh, a not successful end. Um, uh, luckily, we have now Windyard Wind uh, being constructed uh, and looks successful to be the first commercial project. But in US, they, they basically, all the states wanted to have a complete supply chain in its own state. The challenge there was basically the volume was not allowing for that. Um, I think that the situation is different now. So there's something good in this uh, because the volume that we are seeing when we see the goals, the targets, the ambitions is so high that there should be build out. Then we just need to ask ourselves, how do we build it out smartly? Um, then one could look at US and say, they likely have a structural challenge today. Um, Jonathan mentioned a little bit like this mismatch in timing between when you are granted the offtake and you have your project fully permitted and then actually can start construction. The time between uh, the offtake agreement and the real construction is out of sync. And if you do not have somehow an inflation uh, protection or you have an indexed PBA or something like that on the offtake, then this timing makes a, a structural challenge for projects. APEC region, um, that's super, super interesting. I have traveled in APEC uh, also uh, a lot of times during the 20 years. Uh, luckily, we see that things are really happening now. It has moved from being something being discussed, being something planned, um, and then you can say what have what, what, what basically hold it back. Uh, I think in Japan the grid, as mentioned from Jonathan, have hold it back for, for a number of years. Uh, and, and in the context, I can only echo what uh, Jonathan said. I have never in my life seen a country regretting building out grid early. Uh, so all those who have built out grid, strengthening the grid onshore, have, have actually gained uh, a lot by that. For the local content in the region, I think there's a lot of fantastic opportunities if there will be the needed uh, collaboration. Because what we shouldn't see is a lot of factories being built with low utilization because that will drive cost up. So I think there needs to be a strong collaboration in the APEC region when it comes to supply chain. I think that, as I said, there's tremendous opportunities with the markets, the growth. Um, and then one should, of course, ask, what can I be the world champion in? So it's not only supplying for the own country volume, it's supplying for the global build out. So ask what you can be the champion in uh, that will support the sustainability uh, and also the utilizations of the factories. Then a little bit on the lessons learned from, from Europe. Um, one could say uh, an interesting situation in Europe uh, Clearly, Europe was first runners uh, in, in making offshore wind happen. Uh, Denmark started early um, with, with a good support regime, subsidies followed by UK, uh, followed by a new system in UK. I actually think the first system in UK was excellent. Um, that was where the industry on the developer side and also developer and technology providers, they actually collaborated really collaboration for making projects happen. And that was basically what I think the industry should thank the UK early regimes for, for making happen, because there was a strong, strong collaboration on, on the uh, cost out elements and, and how to make it sustainable. And that should then have stopped at a certain time so that we are not at the level as, as now where price fundamentally uh, should go up. Uh, luckily, we are still very much cheaper than uh, fossil fuel. Then I think today in Europe, uh, definitely a competitive market. Um, 
it's a market where auction regimes uh, are dominating a lot. Um, the negative bidding, uh, the uncapped negative bidding, um, is not necessarily doing anything good for the industry, I would say. Uh, neither have I seen politicians being super pleased with the result uh, of, of the strong negative bidding. Uh, I think what they fear is that if the electricity price goes so high that you can afford building uh, what was offered, then uh, industries and, and the likes in the countries will suffer. So, so uh, that's not the model. Uh, then you have seen other good models in, in Europe happening. Uh, Scotland with a huge uh, program for, for offshore basically placed out a, a big volume in, in an auction. You have seen Ireland uh, recognizing the PPA side uh, and, uh, and also indexation, uh, which is super, super strong. Um, so, so a lot of good things happening uh, in, in Europe as well. Um, what, what, what one could say uh, is unfortunate is back to the permit and consenting, because I don't think that we actually do have the time and if we are to have the industry to follow the markets with the predicted growth, then we really, really need to see politicians, governments, country programs, targets, goals move from being exactly the targets and the ambitions to something which is permitted. Because that permitted projects, that's the one that you will take to an investment decision. The projects which have taken investment decisions are the one driving the supply chain going into the bank and, and asking for money for their further ramp up or build up. You cannot go to the bank with a, a political statement that you want to do more. So I think to unlock the situation, which is a, a fantastic good situation with the growth, that is actually the permit and consenting. And then it is basically for governments to focus on what they should focus on. Besides the grid, I would say harbors, infrastructure, make sure that this is in place, because else you will develop the project and you will permit the project, but then you will run into a 10-year delay because you haven't looked at your infrastructure. So, so that's another lesson learned that if the government would focus on what they should, very much around the offtake, securing that the offtake is somehow indexed, so it's a, a long-term uh, uh, look ahead for the business model where things need to line up. You need to have your cost, you need to have the pricing, you need to have the value for society all stacking up to give a reasonable risk balanced return. The risk balanced return is needed if the capital is to go into this sector. If we cannot with this sector get a reasonable risk balanced return and a sustainable supply chain, capital will not flow in, then capital will flow into something else. And for the climate and the world, we need more green electrons, because we need them for the electricity, but we also need them for the hard to abate sector. So for me, the lessons learned is it's going too slow. Um, and going forward, if, if I should talk a couple of enablers, government and government institutions should focus on what they're good at. Developers should focus on developing the projects and not all the other elements, and then going hand in hand with strong collaboration, then we will jointly make it. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Michael has touched a few really critical points in the region. First, on the local content requirement. Michael shared the case in the US, but we have actually been seeing that very widely. Um, a challenge in the APEC region. With all the nations in the East Asia, everybody has that mindset of, I can do it all. And with Taiwan being the, sharing the most prescriptive, prescriptive local content requirement that presented lots of challenges for the industry. And Michael, you also touched on that inflation point, which later when Jens from RW will share with us, will further extend that point on how much 
the industry is being exposed to that inflation risk where all these permitting challenges is dragging that whole project development timing and further expose our industry to that very big, very huge infl inflation, inflation challenge and challenges and risks. And also, thanks very much on touching on that greed issue. I think the past 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, all the industry people have always been sharing that internal topic, which is great, 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 that we never have enough great building um, with us for the onshore and now come to the offshore sector. And with grid still being solved, with offshore coming into the picture, we now have another infrastructure issue, that is the ports which is another internal topic I think will linger with the offshore sector for the next 10 years. Let's see how we can really get it sorted. And this afternoon we'll have a supply chain channel which will tackle on all this issue, supply chain, local content requirement, infrastructure. Last but not most importantly, the collaboration. How do we solve it all? How do we really form a collaboration kind of mindset for supply chain, for infrastructure, and for everything that we're facing now? And that will kind of set the scene for the next speaker, who is uh, Jose Hoyas, um, Chairman of the Board of Directors from Ibojola. And Jose will share with us how regional collaboration, public-public, public-private, can support offshore wind development in the APAC region. Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a problem. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Victorian government, the city of Melbourne, GWEC, and many other organizations that have prepared these fantastic days that we will enjoy here. But I have a problem. Going the third and probably the fourth one and the fifth one will have an even a bigger problem. It's very challenging because I'm going to speak very much about the same things. I came here to share with you three questions and my first thoughts as potential answers to those three questions. And all those three questions are uh, related to energy transition. I know that you know very well energy transition and what it means. But let me share with you, some months ago, I was having a meeting with a person that I have a lot of respect to. And the way that he described to me energy transition is, I will never forget, and I just wanted to share it with you. He said, there are three reasons that leads me to say that energy transition is absolutely necessary. If you have a resource that is limited, and you know that one day that resource will not be available, the smart thing to do would be to use that resource when it's strictly needed. The second thing he told me is, okay, if the human being is aware that he is impacting, however or how much we can discuss, and politicians and politics and society these days get tribal in those kind of discussions, how much the impact of the human being is on the environment. But for sure, all of us will agree that there is an impact. So if we know there is an impact, try to avoid it, as, as simple as that. And the third one is, we have already demonstrated to the world that renewable energy is cheaper than conventional energy. So we, we, have, we can avoid using hydrocarbons, we can save the planet, or we can influence less in the environment, and we have a cheaper resource to use for electricity, then we need to, use, to do the energy transition. What is the energy transition? Energy transition is only one thing. We have to relocate the generation facilities. This is what he was telling me, and I think it's a very smart way of putting it. Conventional energy, had its resources located some places. Renewable energy has the resources in different places. So we need to relocate the generation of the electricity. And the second thing is this new kind of energy requires, and this morning was, this was mentioned, and I think it's extremely important. These new sources of energy require a more robust and a more stable interconnection. So those two things, relocating sources, resources and making a more robust uh, interconnection is great. So in my opinion, energy transition, and I'm repeating what my two predecessors have said, is as simple as grid. Grid, grid. If there is no grid, there is no energy transition. 
I will go very fast through the slides now, but I think this is, for me, a very important thing. If we understand energy transition as grid, okay, uh, this, these are the numbers uh, if, if from the point of view of if we want to avoid hydrocarbons, and we put it in the, in, in, the, um, in the graph, which are the countries that use less hydrocarbons? This is an obvious question. Those countries are the ones that have a lot of hydropower and a lot of nuclear. They were blessed with hydro resources, and they took political decisions to build nuclear power. But even in that circumstances, some countries have even decided to invest a lot in renewables, like Finland, uh, Belgium, and Sweden. Out of these 10, these are the top 10 countries with less use of hydrocarbons in their energy mix in 2021. <clears throat> there are three countries that have indeed also used a lot of uh, renewable energy. If we change the point of view and now we look at which are the countries that have done the best effort in investing in renewables, the picture is different. As I said, those three countries in the top 10, those three countries remain, but there are different countries now. You see United Kingdom, you see Germany, and you see Spain as the leaders. And, and, and they have reached levels of renewable energies quite impressive, but they only represent 7% of the total global demand. If we ask how fast the world, and we were talking about that, how fast the world has been responding to this energy transition, well, the energy transition has only increased in 40 years, 10%, sorry, has decreased 10% in the market share of electricity generation of the fossil fuels. That's how much the world has achieved in 40 years. If we look at the winners, the leaders of, of the renewable energy, which is Spain, Germany, and United Kingdom, they have done in 25 years, they have reached 45%. So the leaders, in 25 years, they have reached 45. The world, in 40 years, they have reached 10. So that's how the big the task is. And the next question is, what happens when you reach 45, 50 levels of uh, mm, renewable energy integration? Many problems come behind. Problems that were identified. These uh, this are not new problems. We have firming capacity. Somebody has talked about the firming capacity this morning as well. This is going to be a very big problem. When a lot of solar power is produced during the middle of the day, the volatility of the price appears. And when volatility of the price appears, it's an extra, an extra cost to solar power to make it firm. So you need the firm. Second, the relocation of economic activity. If you have limits in the use of the grid, then probably the price of energy will be different. If one uses a lot of renewable sources, it will be cheaper than the other country. And then probably economic activity moves to the other country. And, and, and the last one is very recent about the frequency control. So the task, the, the first question is how big is the energy transition? I think that the response is clear. The task is huge. And after resolving that task, more problems will come and that will need to be resolved. If we go to APAC, how is APAC? Well, this, the, the, the picture of APAC, as you can see, is similar to where the world was in 1980 with 74% of fossil fuel generation. And it's even worse because these fossil fuels are imported in the, in, in the world. Part of those 70% that was in 1980, it was local production of fossil fuels. In APAC, most of the countries are islands, and most of the uh, fossil fuels are imported. And secondly, uh, being islands, you have a much more difficult time in interconnecting them. You have much more difficult time in grid. Being island, they incentivate you to go to offshore, and offshore is a less mature technology, as a previous speaker have also mentioned, so you have not the same tools. You are where the world was in 1980, and you have less tools. I already mentioned, and on top of that, the interest rate, it was also mentioned. Offshore is capital intensive, and capital intensive means that we suffer a lot when in interest rates. And not, it's not only raising, you don't see the numbers because the, this, the, this is the treasury 
the US Treasury webpage is, is the numbers are very small. The, the curves are climbing and it's probably four times in 23 that it, what it was in 20, but it's not only that, is that the curve has flipped forward. There is a lot less credibility in the near future, in the, in the short term than in the long term. It, we will, I don't, I'm not going to talk about this. We mentioned that volatility of uh, raw material, inflation. So APAC is behind the rest of the world. APAC has less land, so it's incentivated to use offshore, and we're not in the best moment. So how can we resolve? The third question is, what can we do? The, the, the title of the presentation is everybody responsible. There are four agents in, 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 in the energy sector. First is the administration, second is the suppliers, third is the developers, and fourth is the, is the customers. If we talk about administration, I'm not going to talk too much about this. It has been said many times. It's planning, 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 and risk reduction and time reduction. Risk and time in, in an offshore project are pretty much the same. I'm just going to very quickly mention what Warren Buffett said in the, in the Berkshire Hathaway uh, General Assembly meeting a couple of months ago. He said, when, when we joined the uh, Pacific Corp in 2000, we had a very interesting grid project. Here we are 23 years after that, and we are only one third into the project, and it's already costing us 50% more of what I anticipated. So that's how much difficult is to build grid and how much important. We talked about also very quickly, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a lot of time, but this is very important. What is the best thing for the suppliers? They are smart enough. Their future depends on their own decisions. Let them decide when and let them decide where because they know very well what is the capacity. The world has already enough capacity to supply the current demand of offshore wind turbines. There is 12 gigawatts of capacity outside China and a demand of less than five. Suppliers know very well what's on stake. So let's not tell them where and when to invest because that will increase the cost. Uh, and, and there is many, many other things from turbines and, and, and foundations. The quality steel that is needed for foundation that was originally only built in Europe and Ukraine was one of the main suppliers of quality steel is being moved out now and relocated because of the invasion of Russia. I'm trying to run. Uh, oh, negative bidding. It's, many things have been talked about negative bidding already. Uh, one, one thing only. The world is very big. The challenge is very big. So what do developers have to do? to stay behind our work. That's all we have to do. If we say we will build it, we have to build it because we lose credibility. The industry loses credibility if we don't. And if somebody wants to put even more obstacles than what we already have, well, they probably are ready to jump over those obstacles. Let them jump. Iberdrola will not be there. If somebody wants to increase the obstacles, Iberdrola will not be there. But I am very happy that many other people have very low prices like some places, and, and, uh, and the last one is PPAs. The customers need to start looking at the PPAs differently. Many customers that I talk to, they look at the PPA as a way of reducing the purchasing price of, energy, of electricity. That's not the way to look at it, in my opinion. A PPA is a tool to hedge the risk, to hedge the volatility. When you're driving your car, you don't think about how much you pay of your insurance policy. You drive it safely and you drive it comfortably because you have an insurance policy. It's much cheaper not to buy an insurance policy. This is an, the PPAs are insurance policy. You need to, it's not a way to buy cheaper, it's a way to sleep better. So those are my, my five points that I would recommend. Is developers should stand behind their words. Suppliers, they have to make their own choices and not force them. Customers need to rethink the way to focus the PPAs, and, and developers need to plan, grid, and ports ahead of time, and stand behind it as well. And, and thank you very much, and I'm sorry because I exceeded two minutes, sorry. Thank you, Jose, thank you. Yeah.
thanks, Jose, for starting on the energy transition. That really made me think a lot while I was sitting there. That bring me back 20 years when I started to work. And I, when I started, I started to work on climate change. But back at that time, I have to explain to everybody what is climate change. But think about what happened in the past 20 years. Climate change is becoming top of the agenda that we don't need to explain to people. And climate change become the backbone, become the basic logic for everything happens today, energy transition. And think about 10 years back, we were struggling to see, Asia, uh, to see offshore wind being deployed in Europe. But only 10 years, it's becoming global. It's coming to Asia Pacific. And we are today complaining about all these challenges on supply chain, on route to market, on the, uh, on the infrastructures, on everything. But think about that. That's the excitement of this industry. That's what keeps us all busy today. And as I always told, told my colleagues in GWAC, I think we are all at the best of timing. That timing is that energy transition is becoming real, and we are in APEC, that things big is about to happen, and we're in that process, in an industry that is going to make some glorious future, glorious history, and we're in that process of making that history happen. Think about that. Get your passion, get your talents, and really gear up and jump in. This is a journey, and this is also something that needs all of us to be full in. And so that in 10, 20 years, that we can tell our future generations the, this, this kind of history that we're making, and this kind of like glorious history that is making because all of us are being here today. And with that, I'm introducing the fourth speaker, who is Jens Ofeld, who is the EVP and president of Asia Pacific RWE. And Jens will share with us on that topic that, Henry, uh, that Michael shared with us, how offshore wind can continue to grow in APEC despite the infl inflationary and supply chain pressure. The floor is yours, Jens. Thank you very much. Um, if Jose had a problem, then I think I have an even bigger problem. Uh, thank you to GWEC. Uh, thank you to uh, federal and state ministers Bowen and D'Ambrosio, to Anmai and others. Uh, I'd like to spend just a moment just commemorating what Australia is doing right now for offshore wind. I'm particularly happy to be here. This is my second time in a month where I'm speaking at a conference in Melbourne. Um, I used to live here 19 years ago, and I spent my entire career thinking, how can I come back to Australia somehow? And now, with the help of Bowen, Ambrosio, and others, maybe we can make it happen. When I say I, I think I have a problem as well, it's not only because of the topics uh, are co-related that we're talking about, but most certainly also because this is a, a very uh, tough line of, of uh, X to follow. Uh, and uh, whilst I'm maybe not as long in the industry as Michael, I only have 15 years in, so my time for decommissioning is maybe a little bit further out in the future. Uh, but one of the first things I did attend when I joined the industry was a, a conference on arbitration in energy uh, that was uh, chaired by a lawyer who was a bit of a beacon in offshore wind called Nicholas Korsko, some of you may know him. And he said when he opened the conference, he said, last night, I was lying in bed with my wife. She was reading a book, and I sort of hunched her, and I said, honey, did you ever in your wildest dreams imagine that I would be speaking in front of such an impressive lineup? And he said, my wife, she lowered the book slowly. She turned around, she looked at me, and she said, honey, I love you, but you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> so, for the topic here, um, I wanted to just give you a little bit of context. So if we look at 20 targets, 20, 30 targets in Europe, uh, we see fairly impressive growth for Germany, for the Netherlands, for others. Uh, and we see Asia sort of at least with Japan and Korea following. We've got the special bill in Korea that's presenting some question marks in relation to whether that will actually materialize. But we see Australia with two gigawatts for 2030. If we go a little bit beyond, by 2040 and 2050, we've got the US going all the way up to 110 plus 
We've got the Netherlands alone, which is less than 15 million people with a target of 70 gigawatts by 2050. And we've got nine gigawatts targets uh, in Australia. I'll get to why this is relevant in a second. In order for us to be able to deploy the targets that have been set just in Europe for the 2030 targets, what do we need to achieve as a supply chain? It's pretty staggering numbers. We need to double the current OEM manufacturing facility. We need to quadruple the current foundation manufacturing facility, and we need to double the capacity of investment and, uh, installation vessels that are capable of making these large infrastructure projects happen. So even in Europe, with established markets where we've had 20, 25 years for regulators to come together, all the different departments to coexist, we've got a supply chain challenge and a big one. On top of that, and that's been covered already by the speakers before me, we've got inflationary pressure. We've got a global demand uh, and a global supply chain uh, pressure. Currently, we see inflation um, peaking at around 7%, but projects cost due to inflation have gone up 30, sometimes more percent, which is a massive uh, pressure on any business case. And we have seen, unfortunately, projects folding on that account. On top of that, we see, in particularly with the OEMs, that a lot of the contracts that they're executing now, so what's leaving the factories now, are based on contracts that were entered two, three years ago, where there were less inflationary uh, uh, mechanisms in the contract that have all affected it. And where do you forward that cost? As an OEM, you can only do it to the developer, and as a developer, you can basically only do it to the end user, which is the government and ultimately the taxpayers. So, I very much agree with all the points that were made also by, by, um, um, uh, by the speakers before me that we need offshore wind. It's clean energy. We need larger turbines with higher efficiency. We need larger projects to be able to deploy economies of scale. Uh, particularly in Australia, we are avoiding the land use where uh, grid, grid rollout has proven to be an issue. There's massive job opportunities in offshore wind and it's a proven technology now 30 years into the process. If we look a little bit about the context about what's going on around us, what's happening in the US at the moment, we've got the Inflation Reduction Act, more than 369 billion being deployed into decarbonation, and with the tax credits and the uh, subsid subsidies that you're eligible for, or potentially de eligible for, we're talking 30, 50, some say even up to 70% recoup on your investment if you place your manufacturing facilities in the US. There's a process ongoing about permitting modernization that's also much needed, and we ho heard uh, uh, Jonathan also speak about that particular point. If we move on and we see how has Europe then responded to the Inflation Reduction Act. We see the Net Zero Industry Act uh, targeting 36 gigawatts of manufacturing capacity to leave the factories every single year. Uh, and also here, we see uh, streamlining of permitting processes. We see uh, uh, efforts at least being made, we're not quite there yet, but efforts being made to have clear auction schedules. Uh, and we also have certain instruments through the uh, uh, European Bank and others where you have the possibility of seeking uh, subsidies and tax incentivization for placing your manufacturing facilities within the EU, meeting that demand that I just described earlier. What can we then do in Asia? This is my sixth year in Asia. Uh, I had the pleasure of living in Taiwan for four and a half years, and I'm now based in Tokyo. And I very much agree with, this, with the points that were made by Michael and also by Jose that Asia needs to ramp up and consider the reality that we are facing in terms of global competition. So I've identified these four pillars about commitment, revenue stability, auction simplicity, and focus. If we look at commitment for a second, I think offshore targets backed by roadmaps to deliver supporting infrastructure will ensure port upgrades and grid upgrades that were also mentioned by Jonathan. And it's absolutely vital that we get there. And you would have recalled the slide that I had earlier with two and nine gigawatt versus 70 gigawatts in the Netherlands. So just by comparison, developers, 
the supply chain need a tangible pipeline in order to uh, place our focus and our investments in any novel market. Revenue stability is also very, very key. And governments across the world, and in Asia in particular, should be thinking about how they can ensure competitive projects to make it to the market. For long-term financial stability, we should not be chasing the quick wins, and we should be avoiding these two-phased uh, auctions that have more question marks and, uh, and, and instability built in with them. We are very supportive of what Australia is doing now, but we'd like to see Australia going even further. When I was here a month ago, I spoke very much about the uh, overlapping situation and how we as developers are scratching our heads how to resolve that uh, with the merit order assessment that's not entirely clear. But another question is that even those who will be successful in the CPET feasibility license, they will still not have visibility on what the route to market is gonna look like. And that's something that I think I speak on behalf of the whole industry that we are really inviting uh, state and federal governments in Australia to really come forward with their thinking in relation to what the subsidy regimes will be looking like. Auction simplicity, another point, I don't think I wanna dwell too much on it. It's already been uh, talked about by some of the preceding sp uh, speakers, but I would say pre qualification and qualitative criterion is something that I can only uh, endorse to the fullest. Having spent four and a half years in Taiwan, I've seen it go really well with projects being delivered on time, on budget, and safely. But we've unfortunately also seen the opposite. And you need credible, uh, experienced developers to be able to make sure that the market take off, can take off, just as you need a credible, experienced develop, uh, supply chain to be able to do that. What can we do furthermore? We can have focus, we can set realistic goals and support buildings for supply chain. We cannot take a holistic view. When I was here a month ago, I deliberately gave a provocative question and I'll give it to you guys as well. Rather than government saying you need to localize X percentage, maybe the supply chain existing here in Australia, there's a lot of good manufacturing yard facilities, for instance, should ask themselves the questions, what can we do to become a differentiating factor whereby we can create an export market so that we don't deliver to a domestic market that has limited uh, gigawatt deployment uh, to be rolled out, but that we think about tapping into the global supply chain. So, in conclusion, I think one of the things that we are really recommending governments across the world, but in particularly in Asia, to consider is that there's a world around uh, Asia and a world around Japan, a world around uh, Taiwan and, and, and Korea and Australia and other markets. And what we're seeing in Europe at the moment with the energy independence need coming out of the situation in Ukraine is that offshore wind farm deployment and renewable energy deployment has really been massively accelerated in the last 12 to 18 months. And governments who are looking to enroll offshore wind within their renewable capacity to meet their net zero targets should really be mindful about what is the global competition out there and how can we differentiate ourselves, making it attractive for developers and for supply chain to establish themselves here. Because if that happens, then the renewable energy gigawatts are gonna come and the job generation is gonna follow. I think I'll pause here and say thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jens, and thanks a lot for sharing that statistics that 7% of global infl inflation translate into 30% of project cost inflation. That's quite remarkable. And also thanks for bringing that point on the this global race that is happening globally. It's not only APEC that is ramping up on this energy transition journey, but it's happening in the US, it's happening in Europe. Everybody is grabbing this global supply chain. What is the role of APEC if the APEC government still trying to hold on to those prescriptive kind of like local content requirement and still like very slowly sorting out all these route to market challenges 
the industry will move to the other market that moving faster. So that, that also gives us a alert that we don't have that luxury of doing like trial and errors. There's no time for that. You have to speed up really spot on, do the right thing, ramping up the learning, and have the policy outright quickly, as quickly as possible. And with that, we have the last speaker, uh, Richard Scott, who is the Business Development Director of JERA. And Richard will share with us the strategic development for decarbonization and stable supply chain in APEC region. Richard, floor is yours. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, we've heard a lot about challenges uh, in the last hour, and I have two more challenges as a result of the last hour. Challenge number one is that genuinely there is really not that much left to say about this topic. Challenge number two uh, is that there is next to no time left. In fact, by my maths, we're actually at minus 15 minutes is my allotted time to speak. So I'm going to do all of you a favor and myself a favor and speak for maximum two minutes and, and not really show the slides that I have on the screen. I'm sure they'll be available online afterwards for those who want to know more about, firstly, JIRA as an organization, but also, secondly, about some of our experiences in the APAC region, which is, is really the home market of, of the business. Three lessons, though, um, in what we have uh, experienced in the APAC region uh, in relation to decarbonization and stable supply uh, is found in a number of our project experiences. As an organization, we are quite active in a number of markets in the, in the Asia region, 10 in total. But most specifically and most recently um, is our experience in Taiwan, um, which has already been mentioned as well, where we have been building the Formosa 2 project. Formosa 2 is a flagship project for the organization, but it's also a flagship project for the region. Because when it is built, uh, well, it is built, in fact, all the turbines have been installed. When it is commissioned, hopefully in a matter of weeks or later, it will become the largest uh, operational project financed offshore wind farm in the region at 376 megawatts of installed capacity. Having spoken to our colleagues um, that have been very involved in this project, there's probably three key lessons I want to leave with you in the next 60 seconds. They all begin with L. Leave room for innovation. Local, local, local. And finally, long-term view. Leave room for innovation. We've heard from Jonathan how the offshore wind industry is the opposite of steady state. It changes on a monthly, if not more regular basis. And I don't have to give examples. You've seen them all. Uh, you've heard about them a lot already today. But innovation is at the key of what we're trying to do. Every corner we turn in offshore wind development and construction operation requires an innovative mindset and approach to what we do and how we do it. Secondly, local, local, local. Everything has to be local. As a project developer myself, and having worked in different parts of the world, it is absolutely key that in order to carry out this, what we're calling on the slide, strategic development, it needs to be local. And that applies to developers, to the supply chain where it's possible, and also to stakeholders and the regulatory environment, um, departments and government bodies that are responsible for making these things happen. And then finally, long-term view. Formosa 2 uh, is in that category of project that has been fraught with problems and delays and challenges. And if it wasn't for the long-term view of both the owners, uh, JIRA and its partners, uh, and also its stakeholders, the government bodies responsible, uh, and also the banks that have been financed, this project would probably have been dead in the water quite some time ago. Thankfully, because of that long-term view, that has not been the case. But the long-term long approach is essential to making projects like this happen. It is absolutely imperative when it comes to how you allocate seabed, as we've already heard before. And then finally, the long-term view relates to being local. Because in order to build and operate offshore wind in a market like Australia, you need to be on the ground. I'm pleased to say that JIRA has been around Australia for a number of years now in the energy sector. We have five investments in LNG facilities around the country and a team of over 60 people. But more recently, um, JIRA's acquisition of the, on, the offshore wind developer uh, Parkwind has enabled us to create a platform for growth. And part of that growth we see here in Australia, and part of that growth 
we see being underpinned by having that long-term view and that local presence. And if I can fit in 10 seconds just to make a shameless plug that being local requires people to be local, we are very interested in speaking with people who want to try and be part of this strategic development and planning for the APAC region. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Richard. And you really, truly demonstrate to us the arts of being compact and concise. And also, sir, thanks very much for the sharing of the three Ls. Uh, I think especially on that point on localization, that is the key. That is already happening without being any forced localization forced upon our head. And with that, I'll wrap up this session. And thanks very much for joining us. And also thanks our really uh, honorable and respected panels for such uh, insightful sharings. And next, we will have a very short video from another of uh, one of our sponsor, Ibojola. Yeah. Using Ibojola Australia, a world leader in wind power and a world leader in renewables. We're committed to creating local jobs, buying from local businesses, opening local offices, and training local apprentices. We're building a brighter future with clean, renewable energy to protect our environment for future generations. Ibadrola Australia, a brighter future. With that, I'll hand over to my colleague Stuart for the next session. Thank you.